everyone, this is Carolise, and today we're going to be talking about a very important topic, and that is how do you come up with a new process from scratch? Like how do you design an entirely new process? That's what we're going to be talking about today. Don't go anywhere. I will be right back. talking about how to design a process from scratch. So most of us when we get our new jobs or even if we're working there for a while, we end up working in an environment where they already have their systems, they already have their processes, they already know, people already know what to do. It's just that we're helping to improve that to make that better somehow, right? Or there might be a slight change to what already exists and so the company needs you to make sure this change can flow seamlessly with what they're already doing. So there's a lot of that that happens typically in the work life of a business analyst. But ever so often, you have the rare opportunity to actually design something from scratch, like to come up with a brand new product offering and to design every facet of that to help to create the flow that everybody's gonna have to work through to be able to be successful with this new product offering. And it's very, very exciting, but also very scary. Like, oh my God, you have to come up with all of these things and you can be overwhelmed. Like, oh wow, like this is a lot of responsibility. I have a big responsibility to make sure that this launch is successful. Now, obviously you're not gonna be doing it by yourself. It's, not, it's never gonna be done in a vacuum because we don't work in a vacuum. We might work with people and we're gonna get inputs from different areas to help us along the journey. But you as a business analyst, you really do have the responsibility to do the right analysis so that you can guide the team in the right direction and you can be the user advocate and you can be the one who makes sure that your service or your product offering is going to be a delight, a delight to the end users or end customers. So how do you do that, right? Where do you start with all this information and all the, the different things you could do how do you focus and figure out which is the best thing to do? Now that's what we're gonna be talking about today real quick and uh, it's gonna be good, don't go anywhere. So we know when we talk about processes, right, and improving processes and creating processes, we always have the as is process and we have the to be process. In this case, because there isn't an existing process, you're coming up with this thing from scratch, it has no interdependencies so far, that's the assumption we're making. That you're coming up with something brand new that nobody else has been doing in the company. The company doesn't have any other um, service like that or product like that. So it's all going to be a to be process. Everything's going to be future, right? This is what you're designing to be. Now, in order for you to design that, there's a lot of things that you need to think about. And I'm just going to give you high level things that you should be thinking about as you're going through this process. Obviously, this is gonna just be a short video, so I'm not gonna go into depth of every single thing, but I just wanna make sure I orient you and give you thoughts or ideas that you can go off and expound upon and create more and develop more on, right? So basically, the first thing I would say that you'd want to think through is, you know, who are you serving with this new offering? I always like to go back to the user and try to understand you know, what is the user trying to do? And even before you get to that, sometimes by the time it gets to you as a business analyst, you already had, you know, your feasibility studies and business case done to make sure this is actually a viable thing for the company to be doing. In the event where that was not done, then that's where you start to make sure, okay, should we even do this? Should we be actually chasing down this, um, this, this new product offering or this new service, is it gonna be profitable? And in your business case, you're gonna look at your competitor analysis, you're gonna look at the financial viability of it, you're gonna look at, you know, basically the user market that's available, the, the, the size of the market, all these different things. I'll do a separate video on business case, but typically you start off with the business case to make sure that there is a case, there is a demand, there is a need, there's a gap that you could fill, and that it's a viable endeavor to be running down to do. And that could also be the same as your feasibility study. I think sometimes we separate them, but it could always be in, you know, included in one. So the business case is gonna be, how feasible is this gonna be? What is the argument 
for doing this new service and so on and so forth. So that would be the first thing to do, but typically that's done at a strategic level, at an executive level, they would already most likely have done that analysis. And so by the time it gets to you, it's where they're saying, yes, we have agreed that this is feasible, that this is a, a service that we want to offer. And so your task is to make that happen, right? So in lieu of that, of having that, then you would start there. But most of the time, you already, you already have that done. So once you already agree and you already know that you need to go ahead and design for this um, new service, part of it is to understand the user, right? Like I was saying before, right? Who are the users and how would I even know what type of users, you know, would be benefiting from this new service? And so that's the first thing that you're, you're gonna you know, try to find out. You wanna know what problem are you solving? What is the problem? that this new service or this new product offering is really solving. And so once you understand the problem, you can always come up with solutions around it, but don't get caught up into trying to come up with a solution first before you understand what the problem actually is. So to find out the problem, you have to do a number of things, right? Part of it is gonna be a lot of research. You have to figure out, okay, this is the service they wanna offer, you segment, you know, the ideal user in your head, who, who would probably use this service? Who would this solve the problem for? And once you figure out who those people are, then you want to start getting into their mindset, right? You want to start understanding, okay, what motivates them? What goals do they have? What are the challenges that they have? And you're doing this irrespective of system. There is no system conversation here. It's not about which system they're using. It's about what is it that they're trying to do and what are their tasks like on a daily basis like what is the environment which they're living in and what are the problems in that environment so it has nothing to do with systems so you're not going to talk about system right now i know for a lot of people who are you know it related they like to jump into which system you're using try to avoid it <laughs> that is way too much detail right now you just need to understand the mindset the mindset of your typical users and try to understand what what motivates them so you can build around that and you can understand exactly from them what the problem is so once you have this idea of who your users could be, then you start to ideate and think about, okay, how can I understand more about them? How do I understand what are their jobs to be done? How do I understand their journey? And you do this typically by, you know, stakeholder interviews to find, to elicit requirements out of them. So I have a video on eliciting requirements and stakeholder interviews is just one of the methods that you could use. So please go check out that video. I think I'll put it right here that will explain a little bit more. Or maybe I'll put it right here. I don't know. I'll put it here. <laughs> I'll put the video here that will explain some more about the different methods to elicit requirements. And stakeholder interviews is one of the most popular methods because it's very personal and you can get a lot of information um, from your potential users, from your stakeholders about what their challenges are. Uh, of course, go and check out that video because it has much more than just stakeholder interviews in there and give a lot of details about how to do that as well. Sorry guys, my dog is like barking away. I don't know who is outside, but the dog is going crazy. I hope it's not too loud. So once you have your stakeholders in mind and you have the interview, you think of doing an interview with them, I would caution you that when you're doing your stakeholder interviews, that you try to, to try to get them to tell you more than than just surface level information. You understand? For example, if I were to ask a stakeholder, you know, what was your challenge with, I don't know, ordering Chick-fil-A, for example. And I, I love Chick-fil-A, they have a great service. But they would just say, you know, one day I went to Chick-fil-A and you know I, I had to stay in line a little bit longer than I'd like, and then I had to um, to wait a little bit longer than I wanted to get my food. I don't know if this is true, I'm just making up stuff. But they will give you that kind of service level answer, right? But what you really want to find out from them is, you know, like what time of the day was it and what is it, what is it that they actually ordered and why did they feel that, you know, how did they actually feel about the little, the extra time they had to, like there are details that they're not gonna tell you. So the more, the more, this dog, 
the more specific you can be in your question, sometimes the worse it is for you because you're going to limit them to what they tell you as opposed to you asking them a question where they can be more free and then you can pick up more. So, for example, if you ask them, tell me about a time when you felt frustrated with ordering uh, food at Chick-fil-A. And they would struggle to find one right? because Chick-fil-A is so awesome. But, <laughs> but that would expose it. That would, that would lead them to tell you something that they, they can remember. Or if you say, tell me about your most recent experience ordering food from Chick-fil-A. And they would be able to recall that. So being able to recall uh, an experience is much is a much better way yeah. to get the user to tell you more information than giving them pointed questions for them to just give you one answers. Right? So you have to be very careful in how you ask the questions so you can uncover things. And the things that you uncover would be the problems that you can then you know what to solve for. So stakeholder interviews is great. Once you've done your stakeholder interviews, then you're going to be trying to figure out who's your, you know, who's your ideal customer. You know, if you're doing a service that can be open to anybody, like it's a very wide potential user base, this is going to be harder for you. But you have to narrow it down somehow. You have to get to just a specific, because not everybody's going to use your service. You have to get it narrowed down to a specific set of potential users, and then you can build your design and build your process around those users because they're going to be the most likely persons to use your service or your product. Anyway, you don't want to design for everybody in the world because not everybody in the world is going to use it. You need to design for the people that are most likely to use it, right? So you need to take all this information from your stakeholder interviews, from the other invitation methods, and you have to make sense of all that mess. You have to make sense of all of the different information that you gather, and there's a number of methodologies to do that, but basically you want to be able to identify personas. You want to identify, you know, who is a typical user? You want to personify that person so that you can have, you can feel related to what they're saying, right? Um, I'm going to put the dog away. He's just barking way too much. <laughs> See what I mean? <laughs>
um, in, during the movie, she's watching the movie, and while she's watching the movie, she's having a high positive experience, right? Now she's relaxed, she's able to just sit back and enjoy, you know, so she, she might be thinking, finally, I can relax, and that's a, the highest point of this whole going to the theater experience, right? And on her return, she exits the theater, she's driving home, so now she has to go find her car, and then it might be that she gets home late and she's like, well, I have to go to work tomorrow. So, you know, I, I you know, I spent a lot of time being out today. So she might just end on a little bit of a low turn. But that just shows you the highs and lows, the ebbs and flows of the experience. And as you can see with this, there is no, there's no focus on system here. We're not talking about how the system is reacting to whatever she's doing. We're not talking about what the app does and how the app doesn't do. You just want to understand the user, the person. What is this person feeling? What are they doing? What are they going through? How are they going about their day? And how does their experience, you know, what is the experience that they're having like? So, for example, if I was designing around this, then I would say, okay, at these points, she's low. What can I do to make this even easier for her? You know, what can I do when she's going down in the emotional um, side of it to help? And how can I make this easier so she doesn't have to think about these things that she's thinking about? What can I do? How can we how can we help her as she's trying to get this experience of watching the movie? So things like that is what you want to be doing when you start off designing a new process because you want to understand the world in which your process is gonna and you know live. This is true for all processes, but especially for new processes, because when you onboard a user, I find a very good onboarding process will really go a far away for them to be loyal and to continue and to use it. You know, you want to give a great first impression. And if this is a new feature, a new, you know, functionality, um, I mean, a new new service, a new product, then you have the golden opportunity to give a first impression that is going to be lasting. And so if you understand your users well, and you do all of your stakeholder research, you can put this together, then you really have the opportunity to make use of that information they're going to give you. So you're going to get all this plethora of information. You're going to narrow it down. You're going to try to identify your ideal users. You're going to understand their journey. And using something like this, which is a user journey map, could be very helpful. There's some other ways you can do user journey map. It doesn't always have to look like this. Um, here's another example. This one I got from, I think it's Miro Board. I did a video on um, online collaboration tools. And that video is here or here. <laughs> Go watch that video to see all the different tools. And this is the one from Miraboard that just came with the tool and it basically gives you this persona, who they are, the reason why they want to use a product or service, and the reason why they want to buy it. And basically their interests, their personality, their skills, their dreams, you know, the relationship with the technology. So you really want to map out all the different facets of this person. That's going to be your ideal user, right, or your ideal customer. So these are just ways you can you can document that. Here's another way, which is also very popular here, is a picture. As usual, we put a picture to personify the person. They put their age. She's Janet. She's 38 years old, married, living in Berlin, Germany. I mean, you could get down to a lot of detail, <laughs> a lot of detail, their age, their marital status, their location. It can be that detail. And basically some quotes from her. What's her goals and needs, the motivations, the frustration that she's having you know, the everyday activities and her, you know, internet savviness, basically, and all the other things that you think might be relevant and useful um, to to what you're trying to build. So these are just some examples I want to share with you on designing personas, and it's going to go a far way in designing a new process. Remember, getting to the actual process flow is, is not as important as understanding the user. So spend as much time as you need to fully flesh out your users and your customers and understand them very well before you try to you know, solve a problem for them. Understand the problem, understand the user, and the solution will just keep coming. You know? So now once you understand your users, then the next thing would be to actually create um, your process flows to understand you know, what's the to kind of map out the flow for each of the different processes that you'll have. Now you could do this next or you could do something else next. Um, sometimes people do the use case diagram just to understand the big picture ideas first. But you know, any of these different UML diagrams could come next. But basically you want to map out the flow. And I'm just showing you an example here 
of just a process flow, how you would try to explain you know, decision points and different processes that will be involved in, in your new, you know, obviously you're designing a new process, so it has to, <laughs> it has to have a flow. So now when you, un once you take the time to fully understand your user, then you can always start coming up with these solutions. And your process flows will include things like your business rules, what you can and cannot do, and in this decision, what, what the next step and things like that. So once you get into the, once you understand the user's world a lot and you understand the product offering, you can come up with your business rules based on your organization and what they do and how, you know, regulations and other things, and that would help you inform your, your process flows. Use case diagram is gonna be a great way for you to start thinking about system and features. So once you've done all of your flows and you understand the uses all that stuff, now you can get into the system and how the system is gonna help them. So your use case diagram is gonna be great for you to just you know, map out the big things that the, the system is gonna to do to help your users. And um, I don't wanna go into all the details of it, but basically a use case diagram consists of your actors, a use case which is represented by the circle, and the systems are here. And there's a few annotations that make sense, um, such as you have includes and um, extend. And basically the difference between them is, um, um, that the base use case can be extended to a other use case to say you may or may not execute this use case when you do this. So for example, if you're a bank ATM transaction, you may or may not need the help. You could if you wanted to, but it's not always the case. But when you include something is that in order for you to execute this bank transaction, you have to execute the customer authentication. So that's why it's include. And then you have generalization, where this base use case is a generalization of this one. So those are the main three um, annotations that you use on use case diagrams. And they're very helpful to kind of show you the big features that this system is going to do. So I have an example here um, of a project I'm working with my mentees. And all of these use cases in blue are just all of the big functionality that's gonna happen in the system. And these are all the actors or the people that are gonna interact with the system. And so what this does is give you this great, just overall view of all the things that the system is gonna do without having to get into all the details, all the details of each of these things. So as you can see here, it says get recommendation, update an order. This is for a restaurant, a food delivery system, right? So what you could do now, once you have all of these big, ideas, then you could go create flow diagrams or specific uh, requirements or so on of each of these. I, I suggest that we do this after you do the flow diagram because you could do them at once. I mean, you could do them side by side, but I like to do my flows, understand my flows in my head first. Then when I get to here, I map out the big features. And then from here, I can create my requirements document or I can create my uh, user stories. So these are great if you're doing agile, so these could all be epics. And then all the details of how they actually get get done could be all of your user stories underneath those epics. If you do requirements, then you could have a requirement document that will cover a lot of these. You could even split it up to be each one of these its own requirement document. Who knows? But basically, this is a great way to get an overview of what the system is going to do from a big high-level picture point of view. So basically what I've shared with you is just the different ways that you can break up a very big problem to create a new design of a process from scratch and working through and working through and working through until you get down to the manual details. So you started off with just the business case, should you even do this? And then you started interviewing people to understand what their problem really is, make sure that your solution can solve their problem. And then you went into details of who is my ID customer, my ID user, what do they think, what do they feel, what are they going through? How do they ex what is their experience when they're trying to do what they do without my system? And so you can identify all the problems that are on the way. And then, that, then when you take that, you decide your flow based on your business rules, based on what the company wants to accomplish, based on you know what the user's journey already is, and you, you build your flow that way. And then you start to think of okay, how what big features do these kind of fit into? So you can put all of that together in your use case diagram. And then from your use case diagram, you can create your requirements document. Um, you can either do requirements or you do you know, epics and user stories. What I did not mention in this is that you'd have a whole design 
section where you design solutions, you have ideation sessions. Once you understood the problem, see what is the best solution. And then you do the rounds to make sure the solution is, you know, is approved and has buy-in and that people agree. That's a whole different thing, right? To make sure that the solution you're coming up with is actually going to solve the problem and to make sure everybody's agreed that this is what we're going to do. So that's a whole different section. I didn't want to convolute this video with all of that. But basically, that's the train of thought that you would go through. This is the, the steps that you would take to design a system from scratch. And of course, after you've done your use case diagram, you have the idea of what they want to do. Then you get into the whole designing of screens, talking with the UX designer, coming up with mockups and wireframes, and doing the whole iteration of the software development life cycle, right? And then when that is done, you have the user stories, you agree on what the design is, you design your stories, you support the development team. If there's any changes that happen, you have to be able to adapt to that. And basically you run through and get your product or your service launched. So I know this was very high level. I know I could go into much more detail, but I thought I wanted to give you just a summary, an overview of how do you actually take this big idea and get it down into the minor details that you need. So hope this was useful for you. And then please subscribe. I mean, I say it all the time. If you like the video, just click the like button. Okay, and you can go to carolise.com and I will put, um, I have a, a presentation template that's going to be helpful for you if you need to present um, any kind of project to your team. I have different artifacts in there. So I have user journey maps. I have table design. I have a lot of stuff that will be useful, okay? So just go to carolise.com and get that template so you can use that. And like the video, click the bell, and I will see you guys next time in the next video. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye-bye.